A reading from the book of Revelation. <coughs> the angel spoke to me, saying, Come here. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He took me in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It gleamed with the splendor of God. Its radiance was like that of a precious stone, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a massive high wall with 12 gates where 12 angels were stationed and on which names were inscribed. The names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. There are three gates facing east, three north, three south, and three west. The wall of the city had 12 courses of stones as its foundation, on which were inscribed the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The word of the Lord. Just in all his words. 
Dominus Fobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one about whom Moses wrote in the law, and also the prophets, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. But Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Here is a true child of Israel. There is no duplicity in him. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Verbum Domini. We celebrate today the feast of St. Bartholomew but he's not in this gospel. What's going on? Nathaniel is most likely his first name. Bartolomeo, Bartolomeus, and in Hebrew Bartolomai, means the son of Tolmai. So it's Nathaniel, son of Tolmai. And that's what's going on with the two names. And Nathaniel means God gave. God gave him. So he's seen as a um, gift from the Lord to his parents. And he's one of the first disciples. In the Gospel of John, we see a group of disciples of St. John the Baptist being summoned by our Lord, or, in the case of a couple of them, sent by John to follow Jesus. So they are told to follow him, even when they say, Behold, Lord, I'm a God. And apparently it's they who are calling these other friends of theirs, such as Philip. Philip was called. And then Philip went and got Nathaniel. Now, this is part of our clue that Bartholomew is Nathaniel, because in the other three Gospels that mentioned Bartholomew, Bartome, we see that his name always comes immediately after Philip's name. In all the lists of the apostles, that you see in the first three Gospels and in Acts. Philip's name is first, and the second right after him is Bartholomew. So that association with Philip is well grounded, but it's also here explained by John, who's one of those first disciples of John the Baptist. And he brings out this story that you know the others don't include. They don't Focus, we don't hear how our Lord called Bartholomew in the other Gospels, just not mentioned, along with a number of the others. We, they just don't tell that story. So John gives it to us because it brings out something else. First, notice 
that he's sitting under a fig tree. Fig trees are very large in the Holy Land. And this, according to the Midrash Rabbah, this is one of the very common places for rabbis to teach their disciples. Because of that, a number of people have thought that Nathaniel may have been one of the Pharisee scribes, may have been one of the scholars. We don't know. But the fact that he was under a fig tree may indicate that. But fig trees also were symbols of abundance. You know, figs are very sweet. And these are one of the truly treasured fruits of the Middle East. And so it's a sign that when the Messiah comes, the grapes and the figs will respond. And there's, in fact, there are some of the writings from the Pharisees when they wrote about the end times that the figs would bend down and give their fruit to the Messiah. That comes into play in the Gospels when our Lord curses the fig tree for not having fruit because it doesn't recognize that he's the Messiah and doesn't bend down and give him its fruit. That's one of the things going on there. And then when Philip explains that he's the Messiah, or it doesn't even say that. He's, um, you know, he talks about uh, Christ simply being the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. Doesn't yet say he's the Messiah, but he's the one that they wrote about. He's fulfilling prophecy. And Nathaniel responds with cancel culture. What good can come from Nazareth? Not unlike many silly people in our own culture who, if you are from this or you have this background, we cancel you automatically. Nathaniel was a part of cancel culture. But Philip must have been close enough friend for him to say, well, just come and see. What changes Nathaniel is that our Lord does something he does throughout the Gospels again and again. He has knowledge of people that didn't come from his senses. He didn't see Nathaniel sitting under the fig tree with his eyes. But he knew Nathaniel had come to him from under the fig tree. And not only does he know that he was under the fig tree, that it was before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. This is something that indicates a very important line in John 15, later on in the gospel. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And our Lord's choice of Nathaniel is something that is pointed out by this. And our Lord has this knowledge that the Old Testament, as well as the New, repeatedly states belongs only to God. Only God searches the mind and the heart. You see that in Jeremiah 17, also in uh, Samuel uh, chapter 12 and Samuel 15. The Lord is the one who knows what's in the heart. And we might go to psychologists and lay down on their couch and relax enough to start telling them lots of stuff. But think of how the old time psychotherapy sometimes took two, three years because 
the person laying on the couch barely knows themselves. They have to keep searching, and maybe the psychologist can help pull it together for them. Maybe. As a matter of fact, there was an experiment done in the 1950s. One group of people with a certain kind of disorder had gone to psychotherapists, and another group uh, was left alone. The one that was left alone was healed at a slightly higher rate than the ones who had psychotherapy. I began to show this may not be quite worth the two or three years and all the money. So this is something that our Lord has a knowledge of for each individual. Because he knows the heart and the mind, of each of us. He's the one who calls, understanding what's going on there. And this recognition of Nathaniel leads to him recognizing that you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. He makes a statement about the fulfillment of prophecies way beyond anything Philip told him. His experience of being known by Christ and having his heart known makes it possible for him to make the obvious statement of faith. You're the son of God and the king of Israel. And our Lord's response is that this, you haven't seen anything yet, you will see great signs. And in fact, in the very next episode at the wedding feast of Cana, which is Nathaniel's hometown. If you go to Cana today, there's the wedding church for the celebrate the wedding feast of Cana, and just down the street is the church of St. Bartholomew. And this site place in Cana becomes the site place of the first miracle. He's one of the witnesses. So what our Lord said to him happened. And as he stayed with Christ, and having the trouble that the others did, you know, the apostles had faith, and yet they also had a lot of problems and weaknesses. They went back and forth, not unlike ourselves. Their, the night of their ordination to becoming the first bishops was not a great night for them. That's when they ran away from Jesus, or in the case of one bishop, Judas, they betrayed him, and in the case of the Pope, they denied even knowing him. Not a great start. And that's something that makes it very odd, what we see in this first reading from the book of Revelation that their names are written on the foundation of the new and heavenly Jerusalem. These are not likely characters to be the foundation of our eternal dwelling place. They're not. And yet what is shown is that despite their weakness, this is what they become that it becomes clear that not only did Christ call them, but his grace is able to transform them from their weaknesses, from their vacillation, from their failures and sins, into the foundation of the church. Not only here in Revelation, St. Paul speaks of them, as being the foundation of the church in Ephesians chapter 2. And this is what they become. In fact, Bartholomew went and preached in Armenia, India, and what's now Iraq. And in Armenia, he was martyred. But he becomes a foundation. Armenia, where he was skinned alive, that's how they killed him. They took his skin off while he was still alive. That becomes the first Christian country ever. So they truly do become foundations. And 
Our task is simply to stay in line with them, continue the building. Let us bring our prayers before the Lord. <clears throat> 